Okay, I think people are still trickling in, but we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. And welcome to the inaugural launch of our China Reality Check series. Uh, let me say just a few words about the series, and then we'll introduce our excellent panel for today's discussion on China's defense budget. Um, we created this series here at CSIS because we're trying to create a sort of venue to bring together uh, China scholars, of course, but also practitioners from industry and senior government officials and experts as well to have a deeper and more sustained dialogue on key issues in China uh, studies with regard to China's rise as uh, a global power on the world stage. And we're trying to focus the series not only on issues that are of current topical interest, but also things that are controversial in some way, uh, like today's subject sometimes can be, or things that we feel that simply aren't getting enough attention in the kind of constant churn of discussion about China these days in the media and in academe and elsewhere. So that's the goal of the series. And uh, when I crafted this series, the first thing I thought of immediately was this topic. And it just so happened that it kind of came up right when we were uh, rolling out China's new defense budgetary number for this year. So we're very excited to be doing this one today. And let me say as well that we're very pleased to have uh, this made possible by ge the generous support of Patriarch Partners, uh, our partner in bringing this series off. So let me start off by introducing the panel. We're very pleased to have with us today as our featured speaker, uh, Dr. Andrew Erickson. He's an associate professor in the Strategic Research Department at the US Naval War College and a core founding member of the department's China Maritime Studies Institute. He's also an associate re in research at Harvard uh, University's John King Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies. And he also serves as an expert contributor to the Wall Street Journal's China Real-Time Report. Uh, he, Dr. Erickson is, uh, also had uh, won last year the inaugural Ellis Joffe Prize for PLA Studies, which is a very prominent award, and so we're uh, very pleased, again, to, to have him here. Next to him is Dr. James Mulvenon. He is Vice President of Defense Group, Inc.'s Intelligence Division and Director of DGI's Center for Intelligence Research and Analysis. And at CIRA, he runs a team of nearly 50 cleared Chinese, Russian, Arabic, Pashto, Urdu and uh, Dari and Farsi linguist analysts performing open source research for the US government. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> And uh, James is a, a renowned specialist, of course, on the Chinese military and cyber warfare. And he focuses his research on China's C4 ISR, defense research, development, acquisition, organizations, and policy and strategic weapons programs. Uh, he received his PhD in political science from the University of California at Los Angeles and attended Fudan University in Shanghai uh, from 91 to 92. He's also a good personal friend. And uh, joining uh, the, uh, us as well today is our visiting fellow here at CSIS, our Thali visiting scholar, Jack Georgioff, who comes to us from the Lowy Institute for International Policy and uh, is also with us uh, for about six months here conducting some research. He's currently pursuing a Master of Arts at the Australian uh, National University as a Headley Bull Scholar and a Freiburg Scholar, the first person uh, as a student to be awarded both of those scholarships conjointly. Jack has taught international relations for several years at the tertiary level and has work experience in both the New Zealand and Australian parliaments. And he'll be providing us today with sort of a regional perspective on this issue. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and welcome Andrew up here to the podium and we'll kick it off. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for that kind introduction and uh, for inviting me uh, here to join you today. Uh, thank you all also to Nicole for excellent uh, logistical assistance. Uh, this, is, this is just a, a great event. Um, before I go further, I should just uh, stress that I'm uh, presenting today uh, solely in my uh, personal capacity. And I also should uh, emphasize uh, to you that um, my presentation is uh, based uh, strongly on a number of publications and uh, research that I've uh, done with my, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Adam Liff. Um, unfortunately, uh, he couldn't be uh, here presenting today, but a lot of the ideas and insights that I'm trying to uh, share with you uh, come from uh, working uh, closely uh, with him. 
So, uh, as I think everyone in this room knows, um, on March 5th, uh, 2013, uh, China unveiled its uh, latest uh, official uh, planned defense budget, uh, roughly 114 uh, billion U.S. dollars uh, for 2013, and uh, nominally a 10.7% uh, increase uh, from uh, the year before. Uh, this continues a trend of uh, nominal uh, double-digit spending increases since uh, 1989, uh, 2010 being the sole exception because of a major uh, stimulus package to deal with the global uh, financial crisis. Um, one point I do want to make, and we, uh, we, we make this point in our China Quarterly article that's recently been uh, made available online, uh, is uh, if you look at the, at the uh, at the nominal uh, amounts uh, listed in uh, current prices at the top here, it is indeed a very rapid rate of growth. If you factor in inflation as displayed by uh, the constant prices line at the top, uh, well, it's still extremely impressive growth uh, from 1990 to 2009. Uh, it's it's definitely different uh, when you factor that uh, when you factor that inflation in, and. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, further data uh, broken down uh, broken down by year here, and uh, copies uh, of our uh, China Quarterly article are available outside, as are some other publications. And for anyone who's interested in the nitty gritty of our calculations, our methodology, and our, our sources, uh, it's all it's it's all it's all available there. So although uh, adjusting for inflation uh, does have an impact on the numbers, and although this all began from a very low base, um, over the past decade, these double-digit uh, nominal increases uh, have quadrupled spending, and uh, they've made uh, the PLA uh, budget uh, second in size only to that of uh, the US military budget, albeit several hundred uh, billion dollars uh, less. And even when inflation is adjusted for, uh, the PLA budget's growth weight is truly uh, the envy of the U.S. and its allies, whose defense budgets are either uh, stagnating or declining absolutely. Uh, Japan is a rare exception, but in, in Japan's case, uh, we're talking about a 0.8% budget increase uh, and the first defense budget increase in Japan in 11 years, as opposed to uh, China's uh, roughly 10% uh, annual uh, increases uh, these days. Um, in terms of uh, where this fits in overall Chinese priorities, uh, certainly, as with uh, any nation, national security is, is at the core. So uh, when I say that, uh, these spending trends suggest that uh, military spending is a priority for China's leaders that is secondary to economic development. Uh, I mean that this is contingent, of course, on party leadership continuity, national survival, and defense of crucial national interests first being sufficiently assured. Were any of those issues in question, I don't think there'd be any way to say that, uh, that defense was, uh, was uh, a secondary priority vis-a-vis the uh, economic growth in terms of uh, spending. However, um, if, you, if you look at the line a percentage of GDP here, you can see that according to Chinese official statistics, uh, defense spending is consistently represented 1.3 to 1.5% of GDP. And it's worth noting that even high-end foreign estimates of China's actual defense spending yield estimates of only 2 to 3% of uh, GDP. Uh, moreover, growth in, in defense spending has been outpaced consistently uh, by growth in total state uh, financial uh, expenditures. So uh, what, this, uh, what this means, among other things, is that these, uh, China is spending well within its means on defense. Uh, these, are, these are sustainable increases. Uh, China is not uh, emulating the mistakes of the Soviet Union with its extreme uh, military and uh, strategic uh, overextension. Now, in terms of uh, why China is doing all this, um, I think it's 
I think it's uh, quite clear. In our China Quarterly article, we quote uh, former U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld at the 2005 Shangri-La Dialogue, at which he asked, since no nation threatens China, one must wonder, why this growing investment in defense? Why these continuing large and expanded arms purchases? Why these continued uh, deployments? Well, uh, specific details remain unclear, and certainly a lot of these developments uh, from the perspective of U.S. interests and the interests of China's neighbors have some significant real and potential negative ramifications. But I think uh, overall, the reasons why China doing this is, is uh, is uh, increasing this spending is not a mystery. It's largely doing it for the reasons that it broadly says it is, to further PLA modernization and personnel development, uh, as well as announced objectives of securing China's homeland and asserting control over contested uh, territorial and maritime claims. Uh, developing world-class capabilities, having started from a low baseline three decades ago, and retaining low per capita resources in some uh, respects. Uh, to addressing uh, significant domestic and regional stability challenges on Beijing's terms. Um, undertaking new historical missions, uh, safeguarding overseas interests, and enhancing China's international status. Um, in terms of figuring out how these priorities uh, work out for China's leaders, um, as abstract as it may seem, I think uh, the water droplet made when you drop a stone in the water evokes this pretty well symbolically. At the top sphere, we have party leadership continuity as the very top priority uh, on a steep, narrow base of uh, maintaining uh, party and uh, and state structures uh, to administer and preserve uh, stability uh, in China, um, broadening out to a, uh, a, uh, a solid cone of uh, homeland security, uh, first in core Han areas, then moving out to uh, ethnic minority uh, rich uh, borderlands. With each, with each of these uh, concentric circles, the priority becomes less and China's military capabilities there uh, become less as well. Next, uh, next comes um, uh, China's uh, contested borderland areas, uh, the, the, border, uh, the border disputes, for example, with uh, India and Bhutan, and then, of course, uh, the outstanding island and maritime claims in the three near seas the Yellow Sea, the East China Sea, and the South China Sea. Uh, so if you overlay uh, China's official statements as to why it's developing its military and why it's spending the money, and uh, you look at China's uh, sort of most important interest and then gradually dissipating uh, interest further and further away, it actually, uh, it actually uh, meshes up uh, pretty well. And this also makes it possible to understand, even when we have imperfect information on China's defense budget, we can look inductively from the overall capabilities that China's military is developing, and we can see a fairly uh, clear picture here. This also maps uh, effectively on uh, specific geographical features and China's, uh, China's uh, specific outstanding uh, claims. Um, aside from the, the, in, the uh, remaining disputes with uh, India and uh, Bhutan to a small degree, China has settled its land borders. The vast majority of remaining issues that China is concerned about lie in uh, the three near seas. And if you overlap all, if you rack and stack all these issues, and then you rack and stack the range rings and the performance parameters and uh, the operational constraints of China's uh, various weapon systems. Again, this 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 overlays uh, qu uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite effectively and relatively uh, coherently. We can see a major focus on developing what China calls uh, counter intervention systems to increasingly uh, be able to threaten to hold at risk uh, U.S. and allied and friendly platforms and weapon systems should they attempt to, to operate, bring force to bear. Um, involve themselves in disputes and uh, crises, especially in these uh, 
three near seas and their and their immediate approaches. Now, uh, certainly a growing, though uncertain, percentage of the budget pie is being allocated toward developing uh, power projection platforms such as uh, aircraft carriers, engaging in uh, Gulf of Aden counter piracy missions, as Admiral McDevitt has written extensively about. But these are really gradual, lower level, secondary capabilities. Uh, they're unlikely to pose a high-end threat to any capable adversary for the foreseeable future, and I do not think that uh, uh, the evidence suggests that China is devoting the majority of its uh, resources in that direction, or is, or is heading uh, to that. I, there's, still, there's still the focus uh, close at home. Now, there are two uh, important exceptions to this overall geographical pattern, uh, most prominently uh, cyber issues, which I, I defer to, to James on, uh, in which physical distances are largely meaningless, and China has very decided global capabilities and activities, and as uh, also uh, space. While China's uh, space assets have been uh, developed in the military dimension in ways that focus, tend to focus on facilitating near seas and closer in issues, there is an inherent global nature to uh, space presence and, and capability as well. Now, looking forward to what what this uh, what these what this spending is going to buy and not buy China, and some of the challenges that may arise uh, for China, um, I think we have to consider the possibility of what uh, my former uh, colleague uh, Gabe Collins and I have called an S curve trajectory. It's widely uh, believed among uh, many analysts, including Chinese analysts and certainly uh, the worldwide media, that the US and many of its allies are hitting a sort of mature power growth uh, slowdown in which uh, costs, costs rise, things become more difficult, the economy slows down, and it's not just a specific uh, day by day and year by year uh, incidents and events, but as part of a larger, a larger pattern in a, in a great power's life, if you will. Um, I would like to challenge us all to consider the fact that China may be closer to facing some of these headwinds than uh, certainly uh, some of the more bullish people on China's economy have necessarily uh, publicly considered. It's certainly possible that China can enjoy as much as another good decade of a confluence of uh, economically advantageous factors, but sooner or later, I think some of these uh, challenges domestically are likely to uh, uh, produce a larger and larger drag on growth in a way that uh, will make it hard to sustain or rapidly increase defense uh, spending for China in the future, barring, of course, a major shift in priorities and, uh, and, uh, and threat perception. There's certainly enough money already in China's budget to continue to develop very formidable capabilities to the near, for the near seas applications, and any slowdown in China's economy and uh, resulting uh, challenges to party legitimacy could uh, create what I would call sort of a diversionary nationalism, an attempt to externalize some of those challenges. I'm not going so far as to say uh, diversionary warfare. I think that uh, has been largely exaggerated as a threat, although it can be a slippery slope with some of these, uh, some of these uh, very uh, volatile uh, situations. Likewise, uh, as we look forward, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, factors that may intensify competition for how that budgetary pie is spent, regardless of how it grows. Um, Inter-service rivalry, always a great tradition among militaries, uh, certainly potentially uh, applies uh, to China's. Um, the ground forces have, uh, for 80 years, uh, remain, uh, retained a, a surprising or a, a pronounced level of dominance, hence the term the People's Liberation Army, um, and uh, their, their d dominance is cemented further organizationally by the military region structure. However, uh, over time, as China develops more external interests and perhaps uh, more technological capabilities, more uh, 
perhaps sees the potential to make progress in, in the near seas and, uh, and beyond. The fact that China's three services and one branch, the, the Navy, the Air Force, um, and the, the second ar artillery, uh, each will be striving to develop further in no, uh, new domains and each will be able to claim uh, vital uh, capabilities. The PLA Navy in some ways could be argued to be the most externally oriented, uh, benefiting from a larger Chinese shift in this direction. Perhaps a movement toward a two ocean Pacific and Indian Ocean Navy in presence, if not an actual restructuring of the fleets anytime soon. At the same time, the PLA Air Force has its own case to make as it strives to assert control over China's burgeoning military uh, space assets. And then uh, the, uh, the second artillery force, uh, likewise seeking some degree of space responsibilities and responsible for not only nuclear but conventional ballistic missiles, one of the strongest pockets of Chinese military excellence uh, since uh, 1993. If these sort of S-curve uh, fact, uh, uh, factors, these uh, constraints on the rate of China's level of growth uh, become uh, be become uh, more difficult for China, uh, they, they will probably exacerbate this inter-service rivalry. And uh, likewise, uh, there are some military-specific S-curve factors, if you will, which the U.S. military is only too well aware of, but I think China is also not, uh, not immune to, uh, namely uh, rising salaries and uh, benefits, increasing the personnel costs significantly, um, China's very technological progress and uh, asymmetric approaches, uh, astute targeting of physics-based limitations in uh, foreign platforms and weapon systems, in effect, raising the bar in regional capabilities competition, forcing China to spend ever more on more advanced uh, systems to to keep trying to narrow the gap with the US and Japan, for example, and to stay ahead of other uh, regional rivals. Not to mention, by showing the potential efficacy of these uh, asymmetric uh, approaches, unintentionally perhaps blazing a trail for, uh, for neighbors and, uh, and uh, rivals in uh, claims. Just as China can try to use these capabilities to pressure uh, the US, Japan, Vietnam, and Taiwan, uh, those militaries themselves may be motivated to try to develop more of these capabilities so that they can, they can push back against uh, China's growing progress. And well, close, uh, close in, close to China's uh, 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 continental homeland, this, this large number of different forces and the proximity to these very strategic areas offers overlapping approaches, offers all kinds of different workarounds that China can use to mitigate its weaknesses. These same options are not available for China uh, further afield. And it's especially further afield that China's own platforms uh, could become vulnerable to a lot of these issues. And China would face a very high bar and a very great degree of spending in trying to rectify that and trying to develop true uh, combat capabilities against another great power out in the, out in the Indian Ocean and uh, far away. I suspect uh, given, uh, uh, given different uh, perceptions and thoughts about transparency, we could, uh, we could talk forever on this topic, but since it's, uh, since it's uh, a related uh, subject, uh, let, me, let me just, uh, let me just uh, quickly hit a few uh, points on that. I think when it comes to transparency uh, and China's uh, potential progress, there are, there are three major points we could make and then two different aspects in which it applies. Uh, overall, I think as in so many other areas with respect to military transparency, uh, Beijing has certainly made progress, uh, can certainly be more readily understood in Chinese, but uh, still has a long way to go, uh, many, one would, many would argue. Now in terms of the, uh, subcategories of transparency. First, there's the issue of how accurately the officially announced budget uh, figure reflects uh, 
true total spending on the PLA. Second, there's the issue of how much information the Chinese government reveals about how this budget is allocated within uh, the PLA. Um, in terms of the first, uh, well, perhaps uh, China overuses uh, these general principles. Um, the, f the fact is uh, there is no universal standard for military budget categorization or, or transparency. Um, if, you, if you compare China to other developing nations, it doesn't, it doesn't look nearly as non-transparent as it does if you could compare it with advanced in industrial democracies. There is a complexity here, though, namely that since China is such a great power, since it already has the world's second largest defense budget, uh, more and more people are arguing that it's in a very different category from the vast majority of nations developing or developed, and hence there's a need for China to allay concerns by disclosing uh, information. As for the specific issue of how much these uh, figures, uh, uh, China's official figures, reflect actual spending, I think the best uh, single indication that while they certainly don't reflect all the China's military spending, and I think almost no nation's defense budget fully does, it is getting closer. The Department of Defense is probably in the best position, the US Department of Defense is probably in the best position uh, to estimate this. And uh, US, the uh, China Military Power Report estimates have gone from a 3.25-fold uh, difference between what China says it's spending and what DOD estimates it's spending, 3.25-fold uh, in 2002, to 1.43 to 2.14-fold in 2008, to 1.13 to 1.70-fold in 2011. That's a big difference over time, and that is, those, are, those are estimates worth taking very seriously. IISS, which probably is able to do some of the most thorough and reliable work outside of a government, uh, calculated a change from 1.72 fold in 2006 to 1.41 uh, fold in, uh, in uh, 2012. So when you combine that with factoring in inflation, as I showed on the charts before, China's defense spending is increasing at an enviable rate by many international standards for China. It's affording the PLA significant capabilities, but it doesn't seem to be increasing at the feverish rates that, uh, that some allege uh, that it, it did. Now, I can discuss more of the, the transparency uh, later on. Uh, China's taken a lot of half measures. There's, there's, not, there's not a lot out there from the UN, stand, uh, the UN uh, simplified reporting form, the defense white papers, of which it would be really wonderful to have the latest one. It's interesting when that might come out. Um, and then when we get to intra-PLA uh, spending and breakdowns, there's just nothing. Uh, there's just nothing available. Furthermore, a lot of Chinese uh, statements that are supposed to show transparency of intentions, which China consistently emphasizes over transparency and capabilities, at least from a Western perspective and arguably from a, a concrete analytical perspective, typically are not, do not shed a lot of light. Um, these include categorical statements that may not remain true in the future, such as China lacks overseas military bases, but don't specify what might happen later, or uh, one of my favorites, uh, China will never seek hegemony, which is so vague as to generally not make sense to a Western audience and to fail to address uh, other nations' concrete concerns, not to mention never is a long time, and it's hard to say how anyone could know that uh, for sure. I don't think anyone in the world is in a position to know the answer to that one uh, for sure. <coughs> Uh, as I begin to wrap things up, um, a few uh, notes on methodology, because clearly given the paucity of information available, um, the research that I've attempted here is very far from the last word. It, in, in addition to being uh, part of uh, an intellectual uh, debate uh, in terms of sharpening our analysis, um, 
there's simply a lot more that we could perhaps know in the future that needs to be factored in and will get us uh, better insights. As I said, I think it's reasonably uh, clear that China's official figures do increasingly reflect um, its, uh, its military uh, spending. And if you look, at the, if you look into uh, Chinese literature in depth, which uh, Adam Liff and I have done in our research, you can, and uh, if you build on uh, uh, James's research, for example, on commercial divestiture of uh, PLA Inc., uh, you can see numerous reforms in PLA professionalism and accounting and evidence that an increasing portion of revenues and expenditures is on the books. And and some of this increase in China's budget probably results from bringing things into the official budget that were not, that were not there uh, before. <clears throat> Beyond this, however, I think uh, obtain, at this moment, obtaining internal information uh, by other means or inductive estimation are really the only alternatives to take, to take this analysis uh, a lot further in a concrete direction. And unfortunately, both of these approaches are beyond the capacity of individual civilian researchers working with open source uh, data. I think some of the best evidence of this fact is, uh, and the tremendous challenges associated, is the paucity of uh, published studies in this field despite tremendous interest. If it were possible uh, to do a lot more on this, given the analytical rewards of doing so, many more were, would do so. But that's not happening. Some of the best attempts have been made by uh, CIPRI and IISS, and those are solid efforts, but they tend to be only general collections of estimates. There is not a lot of uh, detail there. One of the most detailed estimates that I've seen to date uh, was published by Jane's, which claimed all kinds of uh, inter-service breakdowns. But it, it remains unclear to me how that uh, estimate was made, how it could be substantiated, and if my checking of Jane's has been correct, uh, recent iterations of those entries have not continued to include what was briefly a very thorough <coughs> attempt there. Um, I, I think uh, the challenge in doing this is also uh, expressed in, uh, by looking at one of the most conceptually straightforward uh, subcomponents of the potential inductive aggregate analysis that would be necessary to produce a good estimate. Calculating the cost to China of producing a given platform or weapon system. Very difficult, I would argue. First of all, extrapolating from known rough equivalents in one's own country only gets you so far because uh, China's uh, input pricing is different, poorly understood, possibly unsystematic in some uh, respects. Then, of course, there's the question of whether, to what extent, and how to factor in purchasing uh, power parity. I think in uh, building in uh, simpler platforms and weapon systems with major commercial analogs, probably some of the simpler types of surface ships, uh, Herculean efforts could yield some kind of a useful estimate. I think this would be very hard to do, even with laser-like focus with uh, missile systems that don't have those same types of, of analogs and that where the industries don't have that degree of, of external uh, data. Uh, if even these are achieved and a few areas are covered to some extent, I think the prospect of being able to achieve enough of these estimates to, to aggregate across the board uh, truly uh, is a real challenge. And uh, in, in terms of um, my consultation with people who have uh, wrestled and grappled with this issue, the biggest takeaway I got from that was that uh, not only is this extremely difficult to do, but that uh, the interesting thing that comes out of some of this is China may enjoy uh, such cost advantages in certain defense industrial areas, especially its very capable shipbuilding sector, that it actually may be able to afford tremendous armaments development even if its announced budgetary uh, levels were relatively uh, correct. Um, in closing, uh, 
uh, just to restate two areas that I hope more data in which I hope two areas uh, in which I hope more data will become available because this could advance our research, could advance our insights. Um, more specific and inform information and evidence concerning uh, categories of spending that are included in China's official budget. Uh, this would help better determine what proportion of militarily relevant spending is actually reflected in the budget and help produce better uh, estimates. Uh, second, uh, budget breakdowns by service and within service uh, would yield valuable indicators regarding PLA development priorities and uh, capabilities. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to commentary by James, uh, Jack, and Chris and their insights, and look forward to continuing discussion with everyone in the Q&A. Great. Thanks, Andrew. That was, that was great. A very good way to kick off, and obviously uh, clear indications that there'll be many more reality check <laughs> events on China's defense budget. Uh, now we'll turn it over to James Mulvenon for his quick take. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris, um, and congratulations to my friend Chris Johnson on, on getting the Freeman chair. Um, we had an, an encounter, a, a drinking encounter in, at the Shangri-La Hotel in Singapore with Rich Armitage a number of years ago that will go down in the annals of international <laughs> affairs history. Um, but I will say, to your credit, with the China reality check, uh, Washington, D.C. definitely needs a China reality check right now, as I do believe that many of the core beliefs and the traditional tools uh, that we have used to try and deal with China's rise are becoming uh, increasingly under pressure, uh, primarily from changes in China's behavior and its confidence and everything else. Um, as a short background um, on this issue, which I have grappled with for seemingly 20 years now because I, I did write my PhD dissertation on the Chinese military's international business empire and had to grapple with budgetary issues and um, put myself to sleep many a night reading the Military <laughs> Economic Studies Journal from the Wuhan uh, Institute. Um, we did run a two-part dialogue with the Chinese, with re senior retired Chinese military officials a number of years ago under Chaz Freeman's leadership, um, people associated with the uh, two PLAs, uh, uh, China Institute for International Strategic Studies, which was absolutely fascinating um, because once we got in, once they realized that we had done our homework and had read the Chinese materials, um, we had an incredibly fertile debate um, that primarily advanced the arthritis in my hands from the amount of data that we could get from them. Um, as, as many of you have experienced when you, when you deal with Chinese interlocutors, if, you, if they get the impression you know what you're talking about and that and you've done your homework, um, you can find out a tremendous amount of, of information from them. And we did. The people we were dealing with, for instance, were former military region joint logistics department directors, the head of the Academy of Military Sciences military organization department. Um, and that, you know, that does, that led to a series of, of studies that I, I would still commend to you on the methodological side that I know from reading Andrew's China Quarterly article he also looked at, um, because it is rare for me to say something nice about either RAND or economists. <laughs> uh, but, um, but the RAND study uh, that Keith Crane did that I contributed to, I think, was, was still the paragon on the methodological side for highlighting some of the issues that Andrew raised about um, a hybrid approach where you can use purchasing power parity for some estimates, but then you have to use RMB valuations for others, and I still think it, I still, still think it holds up. So I absolutely associate myself with Andrew's comment that one can learn a tremendous amount about the Chinese defense budget. Um, unfortunately, you need to be able to read Chinese to be able to get at most of that knowledge. Um, uh, the journal I mentioned, uh, local media, which is often filled with accounts of contributions to local military units, um, uh, very deep statistics. Um, and as someone who regularly exploits the Chinese internet, I would only offer the following caution. Uh, time and time again, we find that the juiciest information we find is in fact uh, a product of Taiwanese intelligence rather than actual information about the Chinese defense budget. Um, and so I would hope then we have moved beyond uh, the false, um, sometimes morally relativist transparency debates that we had 10 or 15 years ago on the Chinese defense budget, much as I would argue we've moved past the attribution debate on cyber uh, to get to policy issues related to what we're actually going to do about it. And therefore, it's more important uh, for us to actually talk about the Chinese military modernization itself rather than getting ourselves wrapped around the axle uh, too much on the Chinese defense budget number. Um, and to quote a, a senior U.S. government analyst who may or may not be in this room, um, when asked about this, I also say, why do you want to know? Why do you want to know what that budget number is? 
um, are you going to ascribe a certain political value to that number? Please let me describe you what I think they can do, what they can't do, what they might be able to do a year from now or two. Uh, but not, let's not use the budget number as a proxy uh, for deeper analysis. And frankly, 15 years ago when we did not see the outlines of much of the Chinese military modernization as starkly as we do now, that was perhaps the best debate we could have. Uh, but now it's much more important for our regional partners, as I hope Jack references, the actual performance, deployments, and appearance of the Chinese military um, is, is as important a, a discussion. And that is an interesting contrast, however, with the uh, daily fed, the feed in the Washington Post about our own defense budget issues. Um, and as a classified defense contractor who is also being affected by the self-inflicted knife wound known as sequestration, um, <laughs> It is, it is with some chagrin that I say that, you know, to watch uh, what seemingly is a resource unconstrained Chinese military um, and then trying to balance that within our own very, very serious uh, budget constraints. Leading many people in China um, uh, to ask the question, uh, the U.S. says it is rebalancing, but can the U.S. afford the rebalance? And is it a hollow rebalancing? No, I'm not using the pivot word. Uh, and is, is, is that rebalancing credible? Um, or is the United States a paper tiger? Um, and I think that is the fundamental credibility issue uh, that we confront, whether it's measured as a function of our budget number. I mean, that's, isn't that an interesting perversion in the debate, that we now see the Chinese spending more time analyzing our defense budget woes rather than us trying to divine meaning from uh, their Chinese defense budget? But it isn't all good news if you're in the Chinese military. Um, uh, we also see some negative trends that just go along with being a, developed, a developing and developed nation and being a more advanced military, in particular the rise of human capital costs. Um, in the last 15 years, um, the, the Chinese military press has clearly showed that the cost of people in the Chinese military has gone from maybe a third of the budget to more than half. Um, and that is a function of the fact, in many ways, of the fact that they wanted to recruit better people in the military, which means they had to pay them more. And in fact, the last time we were in Beijing for the dialogue with CIIIS, they had just received another basic doubling of their salary increase. And all of these very senior uh, generals were all too happy to spend hours describing all of the minutia of their paycheck um, <laughs> and whether they were still getting their Shanxi coal subsidy uh, and everything else uh, from the Beijing military region. Um, now, I also have a tremendous amount of sympathy on the human capital side as a manager of, of, of the overpraised new millennial generation. Um, I, not, I no doubt have tremendous sympathy for dealing with a conscript army of only children um, and all of the things that go along with that that sound very much like the dilemmas that the Israeli army has with um, some of the people. Um, I, you know, I, you know the worst thing in the world when you're a drill sergeant is to get a call from someone's mother uh, <laughs> complaining about their treatment. Um, but China, as Andrew has pointed out, also faces a dozen structural challenges, any one of which would bring a well-functioning democracy to its knees and on a scope and scale that we've never experienced. Um, and so while it's tempting for us to think that the Chinese uh, Politburo Standing Committee is spending all day long thinking about whether the Chinese military is getting sufficient budget, it, it's in fact a very small portion of their day. And they tend to be more focused on what 900 million restive peasants are thinking uh, rather than rather maybe the rank and file. Um, I would also highlight that these are uh, serious times if you are engaged in high-level Chinese military corruption. Um, as, we know, as noted in my China Leadership Monitor report on the Gu Jinshan case, the deputy director of the GLD who was summarily cashiered, um, I would not take comfort from the fact that uh, Liu Yan, who is a very strident crusader against PLA corruption, uh, appeared to be sidelined because of his um, association with uh, the disgraced Bo Xi Lai. Um, you know, uh, while I am precluded by my wise and generous U.S. government sponsors from making policy recommendations, I would, in fact, suggest uh, to corrupt Chinese military officials that they quickly sell off their illicit real estate and perhaps, you know, downgrade the percentage of their mistresses uh, such uh, in order to uh, lower their corruption profile within, within the Chinese system, because uh, bad times are coming. Um, and then finally, I think to, to take to the discussion back up to the strategic level, the Chinese defense budget and, and this issue must also be then looked at in the context of the, of the larger um, uh, challenge uh, from China. Uh, in particular, one that, that, that I would highlight as, a, as, as, 
as an offshoot of the transparency issue, uh, which is on the one hand, we see this, we have seen over the last 25 to 30 years this unbelievable rise in Chinese political and economic and military and diplomatic power that has been described ad nauseum. But what's often overlooked is the what I think are some of the most deeply destabilizing uh, trends, which is that while those uh, while those factors have gone up tremendously, there has been a very dangerous lag in two key areas. One is crisis management on the Chinese side, and the other is strategic communications. And the defense budget issue is just one of dozens of examples uh, where Chinese strategic communications have failed uh, to ameliorate its regional neighbors, to ameliorate the concerns that the United States has. Um, and in fact, I would argue that never before has there been greater cognitive dissonance uh, in our relationship with China in the sense that um, China is holding fast to a set of str core strategic principles in foreign policy and security policy that are completely at variance and outdated with what they are actually doing. Uh, in other words, propaganda of the word versus propaganda of the deed. Um, it is difficult to, main to maintain a um, uh, task, an anti-piracy task force in HOA and yet continue to claim stridently that you will never have overseas basing when clearly the replenishment requirements of doing that require you to find some sort of a hybrid solution. Um, it is difficult to do NEOs of Chinese personnel out of Libya and then claiming that you are never going to station troops abroad. Um, uh, and as long as China maintains that it is going to continue to hold fast to these principles of mutual non-interference in the internal affairs, which as we all know is one of the perks of being a great power, is interfering in the internal <laughs> affairs of other countries, um, we will continue to have a debate about whether China is at its core being strategically deceptive when in fact they appear to be just be trapped into a rhetorical framework. But if we're going to take China its word, let me just close by quoting Deng Xiaoping from his 1975 speech to the UN General Assembly in which he said, if China ever engages in hegemonist activity, we invite the nations of the world to invade China and overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, James. Uh, entertaining as always. <laughs> Jack, uh, good luck following that. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks, Chris. Um, I don't know how funny I'm going to be. Um, my accent alone probably provides a lot of um, entertainment value. And apologies for those of you who have no idea what I'm saying. I'll try and be slow and concise uh, as much as I can be. Um, thanks to Chris for um, inviting me to be a part of this panel and to um, Andrew for his great article as well as you know James for his commentary as well. Um, I'm here just to provide sort of some broad parameters of, of where things are from the Australian perspective. Uh, and I've got a few specific responses to um, Andrew's article sort of within that framework. So um, broadly speaking, uh, the perception of China's rising defence budget expenditures is quite a primary concern of Australia's strategic and geopolitical outlook, but it's not the only driving feature. Um, uh, David Irwin puts it best as Australia's perspective seeing both the bottomless market and the menacing other. Uh, currently, Prime Minister Gillard is leading a high-level delegation uh, to China where she met Xi Jinping uh, just this weekend gone, uh, and he intimated to her that he is very keen to take the Australia-China relationship to the next level. Um, so there, are, there is this sort of uh, uh, dual sort of uh, um, perspective of how Australia perceives China um, and indeed how it perceives a lot of Asia, which goes back to the 19th century. Uh, there is a main school of thought, and the main school of thought in Australian strategic circles is this. We do not need to choose between China and the US. There is a lot of commentary that's gone on about that in recent years. Uh, strategically speaking, we are aligned with the US. We have the alliance, we're in lockstep with that. That is not going anywhere. A really good example of that would be, of course, the uh, 2,500 Marines being posted in Darwin from last year onwards. Um, however, Hugh White, um, Professor of Strategic Studies at the Australian National University, um, is a prominent proponent, proponent of making this choice in that Australia must choose between China or the US. Um, I, I admire Hugh a lot. I think he's a, he's, he's a, a fantastic academic. He's fantastic to read. He's fanta fantastic to listen to in terms of lecture and presentation. But to be honest, this is sort of a bit of a Mearsheimer argument. He's just wrong on this one. Um, we don't need to make a choice. A choice has been made. Um, on the record, uh, Bob Carr and Stephen Smith, our foreign uh, minister and 
Defence Minister respectively say that say exactly that. Um, don't expect this to change after the September election in Australia, where it's likely uh, a Conservative um, government will take power under the leadership of Tony Abbott. Um, in, term, in terms of other areas such as cyber and maritime, um, there is huge uncertainty, and uncertainty is what really create is what really uh, underlies Australia's strategic view towards the rise of China and particularly the increase in defence expenditure, uh, whatever way you take that. Um, what Australia is doing, however, is it, it is hedging in the sense that while it's hoping for a prosperous and peaceful Asian century, security pr precautions are being taken against the possibility of a breakdown of regional order. Uh, within the next day or so, I think you'll see Julia Gillard announce some form of increased defence dialogue uh, and uh, an economic and political dialogue amongst top officials is already all but secure, not unlike the dialogue established between the US and China some years ago. So whilst, of course, from the alliance perspective, Australia is with the US, economically we are very reliant on China. We haven't had a recession for over 20 years now, in large part because China is very happy to buy up a lot of the minerals we mine. We're a very big country and we've got a lot of mining to do. So. Uh, um, for my two cents, I think it would be really worth uh, Canberra defence officials to take note of the analysis or framework that Andrew provides in assessing the rise of China and the, the increase in defence expenditure, as Andrew said. You know, it, it could just be sort of filling in the gaps, so to speak, uh, and in terms of what do we break down in terms of internal security versus external security. Uh, there is a defence white paper coming out this year, hot off the on the tail of the 2009 Defence White Paper, which was rather provocative towards China, reflecting former Prime Minister, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's view that, uh, rather negatively, that China is a threat to the regional order. However, of course, he is no longer Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> although he does try to get the job back occasionally. Um, you know, um, it, certainly I'm sure China looks at the leadership ructions of Australia and thanks, th thanks the Lord that they have a 10-year rotation rather than the whims of the ALP um, factions. Uh, the Gillard government is seeking savings wherever it can at the moment, however, so this defence white paper is likely to be nothing more than a political sideshow. Uh, defence spending has now been cut to the lowest proportion of GDP since the 1930s. It is under 2% of GDP, something that would have Margaret Thatcher rolling in her grave today, I have no doubt about. I just had to get that reference in there. Um, so just in quickly responding to and Andrew's article, he talks about the catch-up argument, uh, w which would fall under my view, the sort of no-choice category, as in... Uh, it's justified um, in assuming that investments in the military build-up are long overdue um, and par for the course of China's economic rise. Even Hugh White sort of acknowledges that the, the sort of interesting aspect of China during the 2000s was that the military was hugely underdeveloped, which you could argue uh, was seen in sort of the lack of response from the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, lack of um, presence of military units in terms of peacekeeping on, on the world stage. Uh, whilst they would offer other, other assistance within the engineering realm, for instance, um, a, a, a striking feature of that was that during the 2000s, China was somewhat militarily underdeveloped, at least from one perspective that Hugh provides. Um, but again, these are perhaps Western standards that Andrew mentions in his paper, and perhaps a case can be made for China being categorised on its own in some aspects of sort of budget transparency, etc. I mean, that was the thing that I really picked up from Andrew, was that basically uh, China is a very, very different, unique actor, and it's not democratic, and it doesn't have the transparency that we have, say, in the United States or Australia. Under the economic growth as priority argument, um, it doesn't fall under White's choice theory per se, but it acknowledges China's defence budget is increasing at the same rate of, as GDP. Is this unfair? Um, not, not so when you look at, say, India and Indonesia, who are also increasing their defence spending because their G GDP is going up. And incidentally, Australia is looking to strengthen defence ties with other actors such as Indonesia, mainly because, when you saw that map before, Indonesia is very close to us for a start, and there is a view within Australian strategic circles that Indonesia will take on the role of a regional uh, power player within Southeast Asia and the wider Asia Pacific over the decades to come. Um, Australia would do well to take on board um, Andrew's recommendation of avoiding the assumption of what constitutes the international norm, and I wish that we would see the Defence White Paper sort of provide a few caveats along, the, uh, along those lines. I doubt that we will, and that's something that, unfortunately, I think is missing from our public discourse. I'm not saying defence officials don't think along these lines, 
of which um, Andrew provides, but it's certainly something that could be out there a lot more. It's just the media coverage of the last 24 hours of Gillard's visit to China sort of just automatically puts on China as a rising power and everyone's getting a little strategically frisky in East Asia right now. So um, I think that's, that's something that's really worth a adding to the discourse. Um, also, Australia is attempting to understand Chinese leaders' perceptions of what they see as um, China's unfavourable favourable strategic environment. They need to do more of that, really, in that we you know, think like the Chinese. Basically, as I understand it, uh, China's in a very unfriendly neighbourhood, uh, and they will put territorial claims on whatever they see as their territory. It's not expansionism per se, it's what they see as you know, writing historical wrongs or um, writing historic sovereignty claims. Um, it's possible that this is um, ignored more than understood from the Australian perspective and something that could be articulated a little better. Um, but it does run two ways. China isn't that great in some ways at understanding other perceptions of it as well, although I understand it is attempting to make uh, um, um, amends in this area. Um, a greater development between Australia and China in terms of trust and dialogue could be developed, which we have seen this past weekend. By trust, what I mean by that in the strategic sense is a greater degree of predictability and an open means of communication, which is what um, James sort of touched on in terms of you know regional strategic communication. That's something that I think Australia is well placed to try and pursue. Uh, the PLA and Australian Defence have a very good relationship as it happens, and I think that you'll see that increase in the closeness in the next few years along the lines of, say, civil military engagement as well as, uh, as, well as possible peacekeeping or humanitarian assistance. Just on that note, um, to me that seems that could be a possible bridge builder in terms of these issues of transparency and understanding. I'm not saying, that I understand, you know, the PLA are very sort of different actors from the government, but at the same time, within the entire sort of framework of relations, I think it could be go a long way in helping to sort of uh, uh, help um, uh, basically make us feel all a little more secure in knowing exactly how China's def defence budget operates, what, what it exactly is investing in, and you know, basically whether or not they're going to build any ships to come and invade Australia. That's really the primary concern. Um, although um, not within the mainstream, I assure you. Um, I will just add, you know, it is for the first time in 30 odd years of defence white papers that uh, China is acknowledged by Australia as a, re as a rising power and one that can affect Australia's geopolit geopolitical uh, say, uh, safety and, and its own strategy. So um, I'm not saying that we are going to get invaded by any means. What I am saying is that China's on our radar and we are very much thinking about how we can hedge in a proper way whilst maintaining our alliance with the US. Um, one idea Andrew doesn't touch on too specifically is that of containment, which is uh, bandied around quite a lot down under. I understand it is here as well. Uh, and uh, some will dismiss this as, no, there is no sort of idea of containment that's ridiculous. Joe Nye will say, well, you know, you need to do that socially and politically and economically, and well, that's just not going to happen. Um, but people such as Rob Ason from the New Zealand Strategic Study Centre argue that there's already a bit of de facto containment, which uh, many dispute, including myself, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's happening. However, China is quite uh, uh, canny in that it will use this argument of containment to its own advantage. It might not actually think it's being contained per se, or some of its major um, players within the government and the military might not, but they'll use it to its advantage uh, in, in, a, in a regional context when it sees sees fit. That being said, you know, China has no publicly declared grand strategy to counter any perceived form of containment. Uh, others may dispute that, but uh, um, it's perhaps more a perceptive tool than any firm framework um, for analysing China's defence budget. Um, so as um, I'd just like to conclude by saying that um, basically, uh, you know, we take notice of this down under. Um, a broader question arises about um, what China will want to see in terms of strategic trust, and I think budget transparency is something that could be worked on on both sides from that respect, um, working in tandem, um, as well as other exercises going on in terms of civil military engagement, uh, and just basically uh, trying to draw together um, a closer relationship and closer dialogue within the strategic realm. Uh, thank you very much.
Okay, so you heard it here first, the uh, Chinese fishing fleet invading Australia <laughs> sometime next year. Uh, well, we've had a very rich discussion and uh, lots to think about here. I'm going to seize the, uh, the sort of powers of the chair and ask the first question. Um, and I'd like the panelists, to, I think there was kind of a theme that was running through all of the comments, and I want to pick up on a couple of things that each person said. Andrew talked uh, quite rightly, I think, about how they're incre this idea of increasingly bringing things in to the official defense budget and how they're uh, showing more and more of what they're actually up to. And James, I thought, kind of made an interesting point along those lines, too, which is to remind ourselves constantly that the Politburo Standing Committee doesn't spend a whole lot of its waking attention uh, focusing on this issue. And I would take that even a little bit further, actually, and say that it's uh, my own sense is actually that the Politburo Standing Committee just doesn't want to know in some cases. And, uh, and it, outside of the General Logistics Department in the PLA, there are very few people who actually know what, <laughs> what is going on inside the budget. And the area I wanted to zero in on was uh, R&D. Because this is a one, uh, this is an area where you know a lot of the controversy about the Chinese defense budget comes into play. What what is a fi what is included? What isn't? How are uh, research and development programs funded? And in particularly as we see the you know sort of strong trend line in their military modernization, and as all of these weapon systems that have been being developed over the last uh, decade or so are entering the force, I'd like to hear uh, particularly from Andrew and James their thoughts on when, what comes, you know, which part of that development process is the PLA responsible for uh, budgetarily and when, you know, sort of what space within the development cycle is the General Armaments Department sort of taking the lead or the component services and when does that budgetary burden fall more toward the uh, state-owned defense enterprises? Thanks. Well, that's a nice easy startup question. Um, <laughs> Well, the thing is, is that, um, and again, on the transparency side, um, there is a, a tremendous amount of information available, for instance, about things like the 863 program and the, and the 973 program um, in terms of being able to track dollar amounts. Um, but you, but what, one of the first things you have to understand structurally is that we're dealing with a different type of system. As tempting as it is to think, oh, that's just like NSF and DARPA, um, there is a much tighter um, interweaving uh, of universities and companies and uh, the defense industrial base apparatus um, such that um, uh, there are better funnels for technological development getting into the defense industrial system um, and a much higher level of state support for that, uh, whereas in, in our system much more of the innovation is, is private sector led and, and things along those lines. So structurally it's difficult to compare the two. Um, I would say, though, that um, uh, that on the R and D side, um, one of the one of the dilemmas that the Chinese have is precisely because of the state-driven nature of it. And so, when we look at things like indigenous innovation, or which has now been rebranded, by the way, the Chinese realize that that is now a radioactive term. It is now innovation-driven development. Um, what, what comes from that also is that the last people sometimes that you want doing innovation are central planners um, uh, running state-centered innovation because it's sort of like jumbo shrimp. It's a little oxymoronic. Uh, and, and this indigenous innovation push since 2006 has in many ways, I think, been stifling the private sector enterprises that drove 25 years of Chinese economic development. Um, one of the contrasts that I, that I would just close that with saying, though, is that um, in areas where um, uh, the, the foreign manufacturing and foreign R&D labs in China um, have permitted the technology transfer that can then be leveraged into military development, um, that, is, that is a chosen path for them. But what we continue to see is areas in which there is no natural analog on the civilian side. There is no natural foreign manufacturing base to draw from. Um, is the driver of the continuing commercial espionage uh, and government espionage that we see. Um, and again, my concern about that is while that is a very serious problem, again, that is not organic innovation. And that is only, you'll, you'll maybe get a generation or two out of that if you successfully reverse engineer it. And there is still a shallowness about that innovation uh, that will continue to bedevil the system and continue, frankly, to create this circle where they would drive they continue to have to go back to espionage again and again and again uh, because of their inability to convert that into organic innovation. 
Well, uh, Chris, that's an excellent question, and I wish I had more specific uh, numbers and uh, RDA process uh, insights uh, for you. Um, I think here's a case where even if it's hard to trace some of that with the degree of uh, fidelity that would be desired, it is striking the sheer dynamism that's going on here in China's defense industrial sector. Now, as James rightly points out, there are a lot of problems with innovation, uh, the higher level innovation especially. But when you look when you look back to the map I put up and you think of some of the scenarios that China's looking at and the numerous overlaps and workarounds that China has available, you also have to, have to ask the question, how, how good is good enough? Um, maybe it doesn't always have to be the gold-plated solution. Maybe it doesn't always have to be the, uh, the American or the Western military standard. And uh, here I would just say, Look, look at the sheer amount of resources and programs that China is throwing out there. It may not all be efficiently spent, but uh, no other major country with the per possible exception of the U.S. Is, is able to do this kind of thing at this point, and probably not the U.S. as, as flexibly. Um, seven major military shipbuilding programs. The U.S. is the only other country that approaches that number. Aircraft, a lot of the proof remains to be in the pudding, but many different simultaneous programs. So uh, that's an enviable position to be in, even if they're still facing a lot of problems. We'll uh, throw it out to the audience. And uh, Lu Xiang, right up here in front. And please identify yourself. Uh, okay, thank you, Chris. I'm Lu Xiang, uh, a visiting fellow here uh, at CSIS from China. Uh, I have a very simple, uh, simple question to the distinguished panelists. Uh, uh, I just suppose you are at a position of President uh, President Xi Jinping. Uh, would you like to to advocate uh, the so-called transparency uh, uh, regarding everything about Chinese military mini, uh, military? And uh, please give some reasons uh, if you uh, if you made uh, a decision on on the trans, uh, transparency uh, issue. Thank you. Well, I, I think that, I mean, of course, there are always going to be aspects of military development that are, that need to be secret. Let's, let's be clear. This is not some sort of Pollyannish uh, world. Um, but I would argue um, that in the long view that it is actually becoming detrimental to China to, by not being more transparent about things that it can be transparent about and not lose capability. Um, there are many things that, there are many situations in which China, in my view, because of its unwillingness to discuss anything, is unnecessarily, in some cases, riling up uh, countries in the region who, in the absence of data, have to assume the worst. And by the way, you're playing into a military security community in many of these countries who, by definition, are worst case planners. Um, and when you give them nothing to work with, they have to start with extreme scenarios and work backwards. And so, um, but this is, this is, um, uh, a, you know, and I don't, I don't mean this to sound condescending, but, you know, China has achieved a tremendous amount of powerful growth in a very short period of time. And we see China struggling in public with all of these changes um, and naturally making mistakes and leaning back to the ways of the past. And there is much about the Chinese political structure, frankly, that prevents the system from being more transparent, prevents leaders from being more honest, uh, because the political system is not structured in a way that allows that kind of dialogue to occur. Um, and it's, you know, it's only because of China's openness, I, frankly, that we're seeing much more of these difficulties and contradictions um, in real time. And, you know, China in many ways um, it would serve itself better by doing a better job of explaining to the outside world the challenges that it's facing rather than simply saying the challenges don't exist. And I'll give you a perfect example. Um, on the cyber side, the Mandiant report comes out about a month ago, um, you know, clearly identifying a Chinese military unit, tremendous amount of information showing exactly what they're doing on the cyber side. China, you know, the United States, when confronted with this, would say, um, as a rule, we don't uh, discuss intelligence operations from this podium, but we can neither confirm nor deny that allegation. <laughs> China's response is, there is no unit 61938. 
<laughs> what? We see the white board outside. It says 61938 on the board. You know, we have the photos. We have the res online resumes of the people who work there. We have their, you know, we see their CVs. We see them chatting in, you know, online traffic. There's hundreds of pieces of evidence that there is a unit with that number that does this activity. And China's response is, it doesn't exist. That doesn't give the world confidence that China knows how to exercise its increasing power. I think uh, James raises excellent points, and I think, of course, there are differences in national interest. You can argue, although perhaps it's sometimes exaggerated and people can have different views, that there are cultural communications approaches. And so the question often arises, for what audience is a given communication intended? Now, I think uh, as from an American perspective, Americans have to understand that not everything is about us, so to speak. So other countries have their own domestic audiences to speak to, especially great powers, big countries like China, have a lot of communications that are optimized for a domestic audience or even a specific part of a domestic audience. And by in optimizing in that direction, they're not optimal for a Western audience. I think uh, if I were a leader of China, I would try to be very clear in my mind about when I actually was trying to communicate clearly with the U.S. and Western audiences, Western public, winning hearts and minds, because um, I, th I think there are reasons why it could often be suboptimal, but what the approaches that are being used definitely are not effective for uh, speaking to gaining credibility with a foreign audience. Abstract sort of moralistic pronouncements, categorical denials that don't appear to accord with the facts, the, these make, I think, a lot of Western audiences not only feel suspicious, but at the bottom line, they feel like their intelligence is being insulted. So I think as a leader of China, I would try to have more awareness of that and know that I'm balancing many factors and you know sometimes you have to pay a price here to achieve an objective there but at least be aware of the prices that are being paid. The, the final point I'd make is in my experience uh, Americans in general and uh, I think especially ones who are involved in policy but I would go so far as to say it tends to be a, a cultural attribute if I can go out on a limb and argue that. Uh, appreciate frankness and directness even when it's not the answer they want to hear. I've been privileged to accompany some members of Congress to China and visit military facilities, meet with high-level leaders, both uh, civil and military, and what I noticed quite directly was even when they weren't hearing answers that they wanted to hear, it made a huge difference and it meant a lot when someone high-powered in China was willing to go into detail, answer questions clearly. That makes a huge difference. Yeah. I, I, I would just say that the one, the, one, the one thing I would tell Xi Jinping is there are Americans who actually understand Chinese. Because there's always been this historical distinction that says, well, if we communicate this internally in Chinese, no one else is going to hear it. <laughs> and, you know, China regards its language as its first layer of national defense. It's its first layer of crypto. Um, but we do read it, and that's the problem, is that we then have this, we then have to decide, well, which is the message, the external message or the internal message, because they're not the same. Um, and, it, and it, you know, we, in our own system, of course, we have the problem, which is that there is no, there is no distinction, uh, and, and our, and because thanks to our free media, and um, uh, and so often what we wanted to be an internal message is externally broadcast in ways that aren't. Uh, it's always helpful, um, but but that's the, that's the problem is that 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 distinction may have been true in the Mao Zedong era, but it's not true now. Jack, did you want to get on that? At yeah. All, uh, all, all I wanted to say was that I mean. Prime Minister Gillard and, and, and other regional actors will understand that, you know, she's in a rather precarious situation. He can't, you know, just open the books completely, nor, nor will he, nor, nor does any other country for, to a full extent. But uh, what I would say is that if he wants to develop a greater new level of um, trust and, and closeness towards Australia, China, Australia, um, New Zealand and China, a little bit more of coming to the party on his part will help. Of course, Australia could do the same, uh, but I think sort of, or at least of him explaining sort of in private talks, well, you know, I might be in a difficult position. I can't 
fully fully disclose whatever. Um, I think it's certainly true to say that uh, if, if he wants to take that, some of these regional relationships further, and uh, I th I'm sure that he does, that's what he's saying, then you know, he needs to come to the party a little bit, which I think is fair to say. Mm -hmm. um, the young lady here in the black. Uh, my name is Donna Wells. I'm a graduate student at Georgia Tech Sam Nunn School. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about the current figure as well as future trends and the ratio between internal versus external security spending? What, what you're probably referencing is uh, that the Chinese themselves, and, and to be honest, this was the most important element of this all, the Chinese themselves announced last year that internal security spending had eclipsed external security spending, um, which when I read between those lines uh, made me very nervous because that, that tells me that they are sitting on perhaps an even more volatile powder keg internally than I thought they were. Um, because there are very few reasons why you would fess up to that um, other than to acknowledge the fact that you have very significant problems and perhaps even the deterrent function to internal actors to say, hey, we're, we're going to be even more serious than we were before about this. Um, that continues to bedevil them, as does the dilemma that they face on the military side, which is, are the you know, the paramilitary forces sufficient to control the turmoil? Um, can they continue to avoid the nightmare scenario of having to revisit Tiananmen and use active duty military forces um, uh, against, against uh, civil unrest? Um, the, the trend lines moving forward, um, I think, you know, we can, you know, it's, it'd be blithe to say, well, you know, China has enormous foreign exchange reserves. You know, they have their economy didn't take as big a hit in the financial crisis. Therefore, it's much more likely that they can sustain uh, these levels. Um, but I would just highlight again, which is always one of the most important statistical things that I always saw in the defense budgets. Um, we always focus on the defense budget number, but the other categories of state expenditure have historically been increasing at a faster rate than defense budgets and will continue to do so because they are basically building the social safety net under the population. Um, and so it's, it's much more nuanced to look at the situation and say um, the Chinese government faces a, in a, a range of challenges of which it is struggling given its inability to generate sizable tax revenue and customs revenue and other things uh, to deal with some unbelievably uh, thorny structural problems. I think that's absolutely right. And uh, again, uh, if you'll forgive the simplistic water droplet model, I think that really speaks to the concentric layers of descending priority. Probably for most states, there would be an element of things at home are more important than things further away. It's almost like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs for great powers. You have to fulfill certain things, and then perhaps eventually you can think about new historical missions and counter piracy in the Gulf of Aden after all these years of security achievements and stabilization uh, closer in. Um, we can also see in this uh, represented uh, the challenges with uh, China's uh, complex uh, ethnic uh, geography, um, other domestic challenges, perhaps exacerbated by an S-curve type uh, slowdown over time. And uh, as uh, James alluded to, uh, these issues could uh, could definitely uh, get worse, especially as if economic growth uh, slows further. Uh, so many things are are hinging on that. Um, I, I was struck. I, w I presented at a conference sponsored by The Economist in uh, Beijing the other year, and uh, The Economist is always good at raising these tough issues and catalyzing debate, and what struck me was the non-Chinese government affiliated participants uh, all tended to acknowledge major issues and headwinds, and all the Chinese government affiliated participants, very intelligent and knowledgeable, but they basically all said, well, no matter what problem we're facing, we'll just grow our way out of it. Well, what if you hit a patch where you can't be growing fast enough to grow your way out of it. That's the big problem. And if my knowledge of uh, statistics is correct, I think even Japan in the 1960s, uh, rip-roaring as it was, had a year of almost uh, no or, or negative growth. What would that, what would that do to, to China sometime in the next few years? So to me, even though I 
having struggled enough with the defense budget issue, I'm not in a position to turn around and do the same thing for internal security spending, but it seems plausible to me that, again, uh, th there may not be as much information as we'd like. There's a lack of transparency, but I think China's telling us the truth. They're spending a lot on internal security, and you don't have to take their word for it. Just look at the various indicators, and it's, it's abundantly clear. McDevitt. <clears throat> Uh, Mike McDevitt from uh, Center for Naval Analyses. Um, first, an observation on the transparency issue. The one thing, it, and it's really to reinforce James's point, uh, the one thing that I think that we should be pressing China on transparency is, is how many of capability X, Y, or Z are you buying? For example, uh, in Japan or the United States or in Australia and virtually any other democratic country, when you go to the Congress and say, I want to buy 5,000 airplanes or 200 airplanes or what have you. You have to give them a number. You have to say, I'm going to buy 1,000 airplanes, and that's why I need this money. We have no idea what the, what the procurement objectives are in China. I've, I've talked to Chinese interlocutors uh, for some time about this and have come to the conclusion that one reason why nobody says it is because they're afraid they're going to scare their neighbors, uh, quite frankly. Uh, but the, the question for Andrew is, uh, in terms of the uh, inter-service uh, distribution of resources, I think it was the 2004 white paper in which uh, made a statement that priority in terms of uh, resources were going to go to the, uh, the Navy, the Air Force, and the second artillery. Other than that one uh, glimpse, have you seen any other, over the next almost now 10 years, any other indications that suggest either that these, this prioritization is, remains in place or is given any more uh, definition uh, uh, to uh, this, reallocate, or this allocation of uh, monies away from the Army toward the other services. Well, I hope there's just some valuable official statement and document that I've been missing here. <laughs> but I suspect uh, that you've identified one of the very few statements that has any specific sheds any specific light on this. Now, this is where it's useful and I guess of necessity. You go to the inductive approach, you observe what's happening in general, you can get a general sense. But uh, this, is, this is one of the unfortunate aspects of China's lack of transparency. Not saying anything about how that actually is playing out. And with regard to the procurement, um, I haven't had chan a chance to look at this in detail, but uh, I think sometimes there are some uh, contradictory data points that, that come out and there's a lot of uncertainty. This, uh, so President uh, Xi Jinping's uh, trip to Moscow, um, I, my understanding is the Chinese state media were making noises about arms sales. But if you look at what some of the more knowledgeable Russian sources were saying, it was completely different. So. Uh, you know, what's going on? Uh, and it's it, these kinds of things probably have very logical Chinese policy, internal policy explanations, but there is a cost and a blowback where the outside world can't get reliable information on even a very simple thing, and hence tends to worst case. And we all know that the worst rumors and the most outlandish rumors thrive the most in an absence of good hard data points. So I, I, I agree with all your points, and I wish I had better answers. You want to try well, and, and the, the interesting trend changes, you know, 15 years ago, if I wanted to look at force levels in the, in the open sources, I would naturally go to the military balance report from IISS, which had always been very reliable. I'll tell you right now, if you want to know what Chinese procurement looks like, you know, you go to Sinodefense.com and you look at the happy snaps that Chinese military enthusiasts are taking of these shipyards, and you see the numbers of keels that are being laid, and you compare that with the Navy trajectory, our Navy trajectory, and, and, and you know, the cuts in the F-35 buy and all these other things, um, it's very sobering. It's very sobering, particularly on the naval construction side. I mean, we're, we're looking at an explosion of, of naval construction um, that, again, to, to Liu Xiang's point, will have to be explained. And it can't be explained simply as defense of the motherland 
if in fact you're now engaging in wide-ranging uh, you know global deployments Dr. Slope I'm Walt Slocum. I'm an adjunct of uh, some kind at CSIS. <laughs> and used to be in the Defense Department. Um, I'm interested in this issue of the standards for deciding what is a true defense budget. A long time ago, Andy Marshall and I, working for Kissinger, tried to figure out the Russian, the Soviet defense budget. And we learned that one reason it had gone up dramatically was we attributed to the Red Army the pay increases that we had made in the American Army in the transition from a conscript to an all-volunteer force. So my question is, has anybody tried to do the American defense budget the way we do the Chinese? And what's the answer? Um, we did, um, Chaz Freeman was very much on this point during our dialogues with the Chinese. And we did go through that exercise of racking and stacking the US budget. And, and to be honest, we did it in a somewhat mani for manipulative reasons, because we wanted to, we gave a presentation to the Chinese that said, hey, we all make mistakes, uh, and the US defense budget, as announced, isn't the whole story, and here's all the other pieces, the DOE nuclear weapons budget, the veterans affairs, military retirement budget, and all these sorts of things. And it was our way of saying, we both could do better in terms of being more transparent about this and trying to create you know, an, an atmosphere to then hit them with the hard questions about, about R&D procurement. Uh, and um, uh, there is a UN standard which is somewhat held to, um, but um, again, everyone has found all these imperfections with the methodology. Um, it's very difficult to do apples to apples uh, on the defense budget side because of all of the country variations on how people count things. Um, even among completely transparent European countries, it's very difficult to do that. I think, frankly, I think CIPRI uh, does it better than just about anybody. Um, and they have a very, we had a CIPRI guy with us in Beijing, and he just put the Chinese to sleep with detail on how to use, how the CIPRI methodology could be used to count defense budgets. Um, which, given the penchant of these guys to attend long meetings with long, boring speeches, was really something. <laughs> <laughs> These are, these are excellent points, and I think I'd have to clone a more capable version of myself to explore that adequately. I did get some insight into this um, when I had a, a, summer, uh, a summer internship at the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, and I started to realize just how complex budgetary things can be in general. Um, James' points are well taken, and... The fact is, although this shouldn't be blown out of proportion because it, does, it doesn't close the gap by any means, China includes things in its defense budget that, that the U.S. doesn't. We have a list of these things in the article. Um, I think probably some of the more significant ones involve uh, retired officer personnel perks, sort of life care and assistance and cars and offices that for which there's really no post-retirement full equivalent in the US. And this may have started at a given level of expense for China's military, but I suspect over time this category is going to capture a lot more spending in line with what James was saying about rising personnel costs. So I wish I had a better answer to your question, but I would just say I think deep budgetary analysis is challenging no matter what, and it's rarely done in the depth that it deserves because it's, it's so knowledge and human power intensive to do a good job with it. Jack, did you want to throw in something on the Australia piece? No? Okay. Um, all right. Well, we're approaching time, and uh, with that, I think I'd like to uh, ask the, the final question, and um, we'll just see what uh, the panel thinks of this. You know, we've been talking a lot about these issues of, um, of messaging and strategic communications and who's the audience for the, for the number that they put out. And it's, it's interesting to me that, obviously, over the last several five-year plans, there's been, in nominal terms, a doubling of, of the defense number. Um, for the last several, and now we're well into the third year of the current five-year plan, and at least the numbers they've been announcing so far, they seem to be quite short of where they would have to get to double again in, in nominal terms by 2016. 
So is it the panel's sense, well, actually, you'd be a little predictive here, that, that this means that we're seeing a permanent leveling off in the, uh, in the level of expenditure? And if so, why don't they do a better job of, of messaging externally, especially, that that's what's indeed going on and take some of the air out of the balloon, you know, of this issue of their constant, you know, in other words, the number they put out, it's nice to have a double-digit number, but if it's actually leveling off o over time, um, why don't they do a better job of messaging that externally? And is that perhaps because the primary audience is not the external one? But... Thanks. Well, I would say that, that there's, a, there's cost to doing that. And by the way, if, if you enjoy this sort of thing, go back and find the video on Xinhua of the, uh, the woman at the press conference announcing the Chinese defense budget figure, because she gets high marks for feistiness um, <laughs> in terms of um, basically saying, I'm not going to give you the defense budget number because it's none of your damn business. Um, you know, and China can spend whatever it wants because it's a sovereign nation. And again, it's none of your damn business. Um, but there are domestic costs um, to uh, going below that number because, as you know, the, the Chinese are very focused on public opinion. I mean, one of the sort of one of the less told stories is how, on the one hand, they're very focused on internet censorship, but they're also very focused on using social media to communicate with the population. And so, and they're very concerned and closely monitor what the population is saying about foreign affairs and domestic issues and corruption and whatnot. Um, and so they don't want to have to answer the question, why are we de-emphasizing national defense, even though there may be legitimate reasons for doing that, because there's a significant section of the population, I think, that is still very frisky about China's rise and its position and, and the Dagua Xintai, the great power mentality and things like that. Um, there are deterrence costs, um, perversely, uh, by lowering that, because then then um, uh, it could undermine the idea that therefore you know China can punch above its weight, and 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 there would be analysis that would follow from that that may not follow along the lines of what they want. So in a sense, they're trapped into a certain narrative about the defense budget increase level. Um, it hurts them because it leads to the so-called China threat theory. But if they were to lower it, it would diminish China's deterrent value against its regional neighbors and against the United States. So in that, I would say then 5149, I would pick the higher number because I don't have to be transparent about whether it's real or not anyway. And, and do you think just uh, do you think that they will then catch up in the last two years of the five year plan and double again or, or no? Well, they've historically done that. We've seen them. We, we've seen five year plan cycles in which they set out a target. Uh, and then the first couple of years of the five-year plan don't go don't go well, um, and we think, oh, well, there's no way they're going to make that target. And then they just roar at the end, um, and they move the money around, and they make it happen. Um, and so we've seen that two or three times already in the past, so it wouldn't surprise me if you saw it again. Andrew, do you have anything to add? Well, uh, this, it's, it's, it's very hard to predict this. Uh, I think... I think there's enough flexibility in, this, in their system, regardless of the economics that will happen over the next few years. And uh, I, I, I think they're spending so f China's spending so much within its means on defense that I don't expect any, any major reductions. I think a trajectory, maintaining the current trajectory for a, a couple of years seems realistic and, and likely to me, and they probably wouldn't want to adjust too severely in either direction, in part because of the domestic versus foreign uh, audience costs that could be uh, paid for that. And uh, to understand where China is coming from, it's, I, I think we do have to understand that different systems are optimized in different ways. China's great at uh, having about 10 top priorities and implementing them across the, the board over time and doing some long-range planning. It's not good at, uh, at crisis management and interagency processes. Arguably, the U.S. is, is the opposite to some extent. Uh, <laughs> so to the extent that there are costs and benefits and when you're a mature great power, you have to accept that if you choose one approach and you get the benefits from it, you also have to pay the cost. So if China decides it has to keep limiting the transparency, there are going to be foreign audience costs and complaining about a whole encyclopedia worth of different types of China threat theories is not going to be credible or, or uh, productive. I'd close with uh, two uh, paraphrase quotes from uh, luminaries in this field. One, I think, that explains how the U.S. should look at things and one that explains how China should look at things. Uh, Dick Bitzinger, who always has a nice uh, spicy encapsulation for things, uh, said in one of his previous uh, works, essentially, you don't, have to, you don't have to count all the beans 
to know to see what China's doing. And I would add, you don't have to count the beans to see that a, a heck of a soup is being uh, brewed up here. Um, the second quote is from a Chinese uh, mil uh, a military officer saying, it's not whether or not you have an aircraft carrier, it's what you do with your aircraft carrier. So all the nice words in the world aren't going to change uh, neighbors and the world's opinions, uh, it's how China actually acts with all this new hardware and this rising uh, power. Thank you. Great point. Well, uh, thank you very much to the, to the panel for an outstanding uh, presentation. And thank you all for coming. You've been a great audience. Thank you.